This is Have You Met. My guest today is a former US Special Forces Navy SEAL. He and his dog, Cairo, were involved in the 2011 raid that resulted in the death of Osama bin Laden. He's since gone on to write a book about the heroic Cairo, titled No Ordinary Dog. There's even a child-friendly version called Warrior Dog. He tells me about how he became a SEAL, and of course shares the epic life story of his extraordinary dog, Cairo. Have you met Will Chesney? So, Will, did you always want to join the military, or, or how, did, how did that come about? I think always as a kid, I wanted to join the military in some sort, but I think it was around high school where I finally was dead set on actually wanting to become a Navy SEAL. Yeah. That, yeah. I think as a kid, I was kind of liked playing with guns and watching Commando and Navy SEAL and all that, all those movies and karate movies. So yeah, I, yeah, I was always into it as a kid. And then how did you, at high school, how did you kind of differentiate and decide, I want to be a SEAL? What was it that, that tipped that over the edge? Yeah, my wanting to serve and then doing my research, I uh, I wanted to serve to my best, the best of my ability. I wanted to do something cool, something fun. I, I wasn't really into school, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I wasn't a, I wasn't a bad student. I just, if I wasn't interested in the subject, I kind of, I was lazy, I guess. But um, I heard Navy SEAL training was some of the hardest training in the world. And I like the water. I've always, always loved the water. I still love being on the water. And uh, it's like, all right, well, if I'm going to go, let's try SEAL training. And I grew up in a trailer park in Southeast Texas from, you know, I had a good family and I had a great childhood, but it's, you know, I didn't come from a bunch of money and grew up in a trailer park where there wasn't that much opportunity. So yeah. joining the military sounded pretty cool. And then see if I can't, I wanted to be a special forces and I like the water and went to SEAL training. Yeah. Nice. So did you, did you have any like military people in your family? Was it kind of a military family or not so much? My grandpa was a CV and my uncle was in the army, but they didn't really talk about it too much. So, but it was in, yeah. in, in a little. Yeah. You just wanted the challenge. You wanted to, I guess, get out as well and see things and, and just yeah, open, to to open it up. I don't know. College didn't really seem, I didn't have anything I was really passionate about. Like going yeah. to shoot guns and serving my country i'm like yeah that's cool go join the navy and have an adventure for a couple of years and then let's see if i can't make it through seal training see if i yeah. got the things. yeah <laughs> so so how old were you when you like kind of first applied for that i joined the military when i was 17 when you were 17 I, okay yeah i made the decision it was seal training 100 percent. then i went and had the conversation with my folks because i since you're not 18 you, you can't legally join the military you have to have your parents sign a waiver yeah so i had to do that whole were they cool with that from the off or was it a hard convince or it was weird i mean i was like 17 year old punk kid <laughs> you know barely <laughs> making it through high school and i'm gonna go <laughs> join the navy and be a seal like okay <laughs> quite the job um my dad was he he knew my personality my mom was concerned i guess a little bit yeah but I think they were both having joined the military. There's nothing wrong with that. I think they're pretty proud, but it was uh, like, I want to go be a SEAL. And they're like, you want to go be a SEAL? Huh? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But uh, everybody else I told around here was like, sure. Yeah. You're going to go be a Navy SEAL. Uh-huh. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. What's the kind of like success rate, you know, like for people that apply, do you have any yeah. idea? Like 80% attrition rate, I say is about right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, 80%. Yeah. So, like, wow. We had a hundred. A couple hundred guys, um, 22 original in our BUDS class, basic underwater demolition SEAL training. Basic underwater demolition, okay. That's the training you go through to be a SEAL. In our class, starting up in the very beginning, I want to say it was a couple of hundred. I, I don't have the exact number, but we had 22 original people. And then um, some guys get hurt. And if you're if you're a good guy and you just have a little inj injury you need to heal up, they'll roll you to another class. So yeah. we had 44 people total graduate with our class because guys that were hurt previously came into our class and it's good we had a great class it was some of the best times in my whole career man it was hardest you know some of the hardest yeah but i made some of the best friends there it was great yeah so how long does that last that that buds that training it's like six months but there's other pre-phase that you show up for it's about a month and i showed up a little earlier i got the opportunity to show up and help out with a previous class that was going through and go see them and support them and 
So I showed up a few months early. I got lucky. It was very fortunate. It was really cool to be able to see all that. Nice. And what kind of stuff is like in the training? Like what are some of the main or some of the most memorable parts of the training, whether it's the most like grueling bits or <laughs> interesting or <laughs> it's a lot of, uh, well, the whole point of the training is to get you to quit, at least in the very beginning. Yeah. They just want to make sure you want to be there. You have to be literally willing to sacrifice your life for your friend, to put it on the line out in the field and they need to count on you to never quit. So yeah, to make the training intense to make sure you really want to be there. And, uh, so there's a lot of just pain and sucking it up stuff that you don't want to do, but teamwork, it builds teamwork working together as a team. And, um, it gets rid of the people that don't need to be there. But then yeah. there's also a lot of humor because I mean, when you're in some of the worst situations like that, instead of just being in a terrible spot, I mean, sure, there's a bunch of pain, but you just joke around as much as you can. So there's a lot of comedy, a lot of yeah. and joking. And made, like I said, I made some of the best friends there, but, uh, once you get past that, you, there's, you go through a thing called hell week. <clears throat> Sounds fun. Yeah. It's five and a half days of basically no sleep. And so uh, you get most of your, your quitters during hell week, I would say. Yeah. Quite a, a, quite a, it's the most wow. in, in, intense part of the whole ordeal. Yeah. You know, you can go into more detail if you want to, but basically it's just where they get most of the guys to quit. Yeah. Go into a little bit more detail. Tell me a bit more about it. It's out, five yeah. and a half days of continuous <laughs> trying to get guys quit with anything that the instructors can think of basically. I mean, there's a schedule to it, but you're just basically there to go get in the surf zone until you, they have charts to how cold the water is. And yeah. Check you. They're very safe, but they check you for hypothermia and they're able to just make you cold and miserable and sandy and then exercise and it just doesn't stop. So a lot of guys can't do that and they just don't, they decide that it's not the job for them. Yeah, that's hectic. So I guess it's like you've been going for like 10, 12 hours and you're, you're like, oh, I, I get the feeling maybe we're going to finish soon. And then just as you're feeling that, they're like, okay, another six hours, crack on. One of the worst <laughs> parts of the whole week is like you do something like that. You're up for, they make you stay up for a few days and you're very exhausted. By the end of it, I had a big bald spot. You could just see the, the, you'd carry these boats on top of your head. And it rubbed out. I had just a big bald spot on top of my head from it rubbing out Seriously. my hair. And you're completely chafed. Like you get just wet and sandy the whole time and you're running miles and miles. So, Jeez. but, um, you're up for a couple of days. They'll let you get a couple of hours of sleep. You're all nice and warm. You get some sleep and they wake you up really nice. They don't scream at you. They just make you go stand on this, on the berm and wave by the sun. And a lot of people don't want to get wet again. They're nice and comfy. And they're tired. They just want to go back to sleep. And that's, that's a really hard thing to, you have to really want to uh, to be there. And go yeah. get wet. A lot of guys like they don't they don't scream. They're just nice. If you want to go quit, go quit. It's fine. But if not, you just go get back in the in the cold water. And it's good, man. But yeah, because are- I, I guess the logic maybe there is screaming. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Like, there's not always going to be somebody to scream at you. You need to really motivate yourself. I guess is the point there. If they wake you up by screaming and the machine guns going, like they they do that as well. Mm. But to get your adrenaline going and getting in the cold water isn't as bad, but if they're just, yeah, you're still half asleep and they want you to go get in an ice bath. Yeah. Great. Perfect. <laughs> it would definitely be easier to do with somebody screaming at me saying, do it, do it. Instead of like, if you, if you, if you don't want to do it, you know, like, uh, oh, it would be hard, wouldn't it? To really force Stay yourself warm, in we'll there. Need you. Yeah. So it's, uh, did you, did you ever get tempted? And I, I don't mean really tempted, like strongly consider, but was there ever the thought entering your mind? Like, Oh, maybe I should just fuck this off. Kind of, but not really. Well, the, there was one time where it was already in a uh, third phase. So you, you're, you're there for quite a while. And um, usually guys don't have to quit in third phase, but there's a long swim. Mm-hmm. It's a five and a half nautical mile ocean swim that you do. And it was just a bad morning. Uh, the, the day before I didn't know there was a timeline. So me and my swim buddy, I was very comfortable in the water, but we weren't the fastest to swim pair. I mean, we were okay with the five and a half mile. That was a long swim and the, yeah. we might have didn't make the cutoff time. And that was a long swim. So the next day they're like, you're redoing it. So I'm like, oh man, okay, here we go. Two days in a row. Like this ought to be good on the way into the, I'm already in trouble because we didn't make the time. I'm like, crap. I don't like getting troubled. Then the eyeballs are on you. Yeah. Then I'm like, holy crap can I make it another five and a half miles like on time this time? Like I'm going to have to put out harder than I did yesterday. And then on the way into through the surf, I lost a fin. Oh, shit. <laughs> so I dropped one of my fins 
it's dark still. We're starting at night. Oh, so that man. was a good one. That was one of the ones where I'm like, oh, man. I didn't think about quitting, but I'm like, I don't think I'm going to make it. Because I'm not yeah. telling you because I lost a fin. I'm going to go out there, and me and my swim buddy are just going to make this in time. We're going to do it with one fin, I guess, is what my plan was. Or Yeah. yeah. But they uh, luckily for us, they were just playing another mind game. and They called us back in. And on the way back in, one of my best friends, his name is Jared, he found my swim fin in the surf zone. So he picks it up for me. And as we're running back in, he's like, is this yours? And he ended up, it ended up being going from like a really, really bad day to a great day. So it's yeah. Pretty- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet that was good for your morale at that moment. You needed that. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was about to be a real bad day. And it ended yeah. up just flipping around in the heartbeat. Like, oh, thank God. Yeah yeah that's hectic man okay so where did you go from then so you got through hell week you, you made it through hell and then where did you go after hell it's just more buds there's more just uh training to get you comfortable diving in the water mm-hmm. and it's still not easy but there you still have a couple of quarters but it's not like the first phase is kind of the intense phase to get people gone and who, who really want to be there and then the second phase just make sure you're comfortable in the water and you can prefer, perform certain tasks mm-hmm. just be calm because being under the water and you cut off oxygen or they fill your mask up with water, you never really know how yeah. you're going to react. Some people panic underwater. Yeah. So they – Understandable. So it makes you very comfortable. And I, luckily for me, I was fairly comfortable. I, was, I wasn't very fast in the water sometimes, but I was felt pretty comfortable. So yeah. it was good. Uh, I had my, my hiccups here and there in second phase. But overall, it was very valuable. I had some good times. learned a lot made my water skills more proficient. In the third phase, you go into it's what we call land warfare. So navigation and weapons, a lot of weapons handling learning. I learned really how to shoot proficiently. I learned in, in instruction is great. I didn't mm-hmm. really shoot too much as a kid growing up. So they have a certain way to teach you to, to start with the fundamentals. And uh, we perfected those pretty well. And it was good. Yeah. And then uh, a bunch of other stuff, learning how to move together and different things and uh, training doesn't end there you graduate buds and show up to a team but you have to you have a few more evolutions you got a little like jumping uh, jumping out of an airplane for a little bit a little cold weather stuff but yeah after that you show up to a team and that's when it really that really really starts <laughs> okay well before we go into that when you're like doing the the phase two or three or whichever i think it was two in terms of like being underwater do they teach you any or like train you in any breath work to be able to like really hold your breath for long periods of time or is it just like hold your breath and just figure it out and just improve yourself in the very beginning even before phase two there was a lot of emphasis on swimming and Mm -hmm. luckily for me like i said i grew up in a trailer park the community pool was didn't exist so (laughs) i didn't swim much as a kid uh so i wasn't i wasn't very efficient so i'm glad we got to spend a lot of time learning to swim but during that since i knew one of my weaknesses was kind of, I love being in the water and I was comfortable. I just wasn't fast. And there's a 50 meter underwater breath hold that you have to do. It's no joke. It's yeah, no kicking off on one side. You got to do a front flip. And so it's, it's a challenge mm. and I knew I was slow. So I worked on the, my breath hold myself. So I, I knew that was a weakness of mine. Yeah. It's going to get better because they were going to teach me, but I also needed to try to, I didn't want to fail out. So I bought a, I think they're called a power line. Okay, I think I've heard like of it. One of the, if you're in the hospital and you have respiratory problems, it's one of those things. Those balls blow. It's kind of like that, except you're just working on your lung strength and stuff like that. So I bought one of those, and I worked yeah. on breath holds. Definitely worked on breath holds a lot. So that, between trying to strengthen my lungs and work on breath, work on breath holds, I um, I would just never recommend anybody do that alone, especially in the water series. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. We've yeah. actually lost a few teammates of mine. Oh, really? They were together as a team. But I, I I don't know the exact story. Uh, they were, they might have been doing them together, and it was just not a good. Yeah, so I would never recommend working on your breath hold alone. Always have supervision. That's a weird. Yeah. Thing. But I definitely worked on breath holds. I actually had I think one of the longest in the class, so it was pretty cool. How long I did you get it up to? I don't know exactly. I don't know if I ever broke three minutes, but it was pretty decent. Yeah, yeah, two minutes. Nowadays plus I'm working kind of on thing. five, so I'm getting <laughs> 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 working on it again. 
Yeah, because I mean, there are techniques out there, aren't there? Like, uh, there are. That, that you can really, and I think you can even do them quite quickly. Like, I think I've seen Wim Hof maybe do some of these, and Wim there's Hoff. different people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where you can really just do this focused breathing and get it up to like, yeah, holding. I mean, I haven't done it. I'm, a, I'm a bit, yeah, afraid to do that. The magician, yeah. or like, uh, I think he had him on Tim Ferriss. I think he did a podcast. He did. It's a ridiculous amount of time. Yeah, but I like Wim. Wim. Oh uh, yeah, like David Blaine, Ferris. wasn't it? Blaine. Maybe. Yeah, that was, yeah, that's mad. Yeah, it was but I would have thought maybe they could teach something like that in the or like do some kind of techniques like that in in seals and in like special forces. Be careful passing out too. So you're just yeah. working. On, I was just doing it as the basic. I don't know, maybe my method was wrong, but I just needed to be able to take a breath and hold it mm. and tie knots or do scuba equipment or yeah. swim for a very long time underwater. So and I, I don't need to be doing a. <sighs> A hyperventilation where I can pass out. I need to just be able to take a yeah. breath, and five minutes later, hopefully, I'm still there. <laughs> you know, like yeah. as far as you can get it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, so anyway, you said you're going on to that that new phase of training after that the the team teams uh, training. Is that right? Yes, yeah, so you show up to a uh, SEAL team. Yeah, and then there's just uh, more advanced training from there. You start to grow a bond with your guys, and it's a very tight community that we have in the teams. So you're just integrating into your new team. And yeah. And that's the team that you'll then potentially deploy with. Is that right? Or deploy with yeah. Them, you know, so, that's so Bud cool. is just basic underwater demolition seal training. That's just to get your foot in the door to make sure yeah. you're working with it. Nobody really, once you get to your team, you just, you get, just because you made it through some of the military, the hardest military training in the world doesn't mean anything. Like everybody now at the team has already done that. So good job. You still can get uh, fired at any time. If you're yeah. not performing. So just because you made it through this doesn't like good job. You prove that you can be here now. Prove that you want to stay here. Yeah, don't get complacent. No, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right. There's always somebody else that'll want to do your job too. And and obviously the job is dangerous. So if you don't really want to be there, then Yeah, definitely. So how did you go then from that point to this might be a big jump, so I don't know like if it's how much time is going to be in between here, but to getting introduced to like military working dogs and things like that. I mean, if it's a massive jump, feel free to kind of touch on a few points leading up to that. But yeah, so I did a couple of deployments at uh, SEAL Team Four. So mm -hmm. I was in good deployments. And how how soon was your first deployment after finishing your training? It was quite a while. I'd say a year to a year and a half. Yeah, and okay. that was just more advanced training, maybe a little bit of time off. Excuse me. Um, had some very good deployments. My first deployment might have been a little slower. We were doing some maybe some, we were doing some security detail for some high level people in Iraq. Still did, got to do a few couple uh, a few fun things, but um, second deployment with SEAL Team Four was definitely way better. It was way more op the op tempo was definitely higher. We got to go out a lot. We were in Baghdad again, and we had to operate in an area called Solder City, which was a really bad place at the time. So right. That deployment was <clears throat> six months of a lot of work with a lot of great guys. And I think we did some great things, um, great experiences. And then once we returned, once I returned back from that deployment that we did, I screened to go to development group. And then that's another training process. It's like kind of like going through buds again, except different. It's more okay. performance based instead of just, uh, I mean, buds is performance based as well, but this is more focused. They already know you're not going to quit. You're already a bunch of seals. So it's, yeah. Not so much testing you and let us, yeah. Just being a professional and mm -hmm. showing that you can operate at a, at a high level. So that was a great uh, time, very intense, but I uh, made it through that and I showed up to a squadron and it was, um, it was back to work. I, I was very fortunate in my career. I, I worked hard to try to make myself as valuable as possible. I was a young kid. I joined at 17. You know, I'd left when I was 18. And, I was in my twenties in the teams and I was high speed job yeah. I wanted to do. And I was, I had plenty of energy to do it and it was where I wanted, I didn't want to be doing anything else. Um, so I dove in and I wanted to make myself as valuable pos as possible. And I did and had some great experiences with some great people. Nice. And then, so that's, that's two deployments you've done by that point, by like your really early twenties or by, by about 20, I guess. And then, so how yeah so then leading again towards the the dogs your first introduction to to working first dogs first introduction into dogs was when I got to my squadron after um, 
passing selection. You know, just um, I didn't know really. I had seen a demonstration before when I was at SEAL Team Four. Um, just a quick demonstration while we were <clears throat> out on a training trip. They brought a military working dog out, a handler. And they had one of us put on a bite suit. One of the members of our team had him run out in the field. And the dog tackles him and bites him, and we just you know, it was just a quick demonstration and kind of told us some of the capabilities. But it didn't really click in the time, but once I showed up to the squadron, I they were using the dogs and. I got to see how valuable they really were if while they were being used properly. And it was, uh, I love dogs growing up. I always had dogs. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Dog, I love dogs. These were amazing dogs. Um, and just to see the value of what they can do for us. Like we literally save our lives. It's, it's a big deal because I have these dogs. It's not an easy job. and There's a lot of work that goes into it. But when you are using a dog and the dog pays off, it's a really big deal and it's very satisfying. So, like I said, I love dogs. So when I saw the value of the dogs on my first deployment, like there's a saying in the book. So an ordinary dog, the book I wrote about Cairo, who's saying yeah. this. I remember being in the team room and somebody said, like, raise your hand if the dog's ever saved your life, right? Or we were talking. Everybody's hand in the team room went up. It's just wow. crazy to see. Like everybody had a story where a dog multiple stories probably wow. like yeah. yeah oh yeah i got a story it's amazing. <laughs> so they were very valuable and i saw that over and over again on my first deployment and just because you're a seal when you show up it doesn't mean you better make yourself as valuable as possible and i wanted to go on every mission selfishly i didn't want to get left behind and have to do a job that i didn't really want to do i wanted to be with my guys that i cared about and yeah operating and doing the job to the best of my ability well i could so in order to do that, you just make yourself as valuable as possible. And I love dogs. So it's like, I'll handle the dog to, um, yeah, put it, it was extra work, but everybody has to put in extra work, you know, just because your seal doesn't mean your job's done. Yeah. Contribute yeah. In some way. And, uh, yeah, that's the job so, that I wanted so, to do. So all your other responsibilities are basically the same. You just have this on top. Is that, is that what it's, it is? Or is wow. Thing. So like if you're into big, if you're a big skydiver, you can take over that really get into that and help help with that department or if you're big mm. if you like explosives and breaching you can really go into that there's mm. just different things you can dive into more to contribute more to the team yeah and so, so being dog, a dog guy you were like this is me dog, this is all me <laughs> and it yeah. ended up being a very great job and i learned a lot from handling a dog it teaches you it taught me a lot i'm a quiet guy so it taught me how to step out of my comfort zone because you the dogs don't speak english yes yeah. hey dude good job yeah. you know what i mean like <laughs> You have to use body language and your tone of voice and you have and to shout and yeah. yeah. You have to step out of, I had to step out of my comfort zone in order to communicate and patience. You have to be very patient. Yeah. Learning to read a dog and the body language and stepping back also like to training was obviously very important. So it's like, I want to train, 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 but also like if it's bad training, you know, we'll recognize that you want yeah. to do good quality training for, for the dog. So if I'm in a bad mood and I'm being an asshole, we have to, the emotions go down the leash to the dog. The dog mm. feels that it's just not going to be good training. So you have to have a good day of training or be able to put the dog up. And it's, it's good. I learned a lot from, from dog training, stepping on my comfort zone. And it's all kinds of things I learned. Yeah. It's a very valuable job. Awesome. So, so take me to that moment then. So you're like, okay, I can do this. I want, I want to be a, you know, I want to be a dog handler or I don't know how you, what the exact terminology is, but yeah, I want to be a, a dog guy with this. I want to have a dog. Brought it up to dog people, and we brought it up to my boss, and it was just a done deal. I'm like, good. Yeah, we it was a it was an important job, and yeah, not everybody wants to to do that to have that responsibility. Like I said, you just kind of whatever you're passionate about. Everybody's different, right? So when you show up to the mm -hmm. team, you're like, I really like to do this. I really like to do that. Not everybody's into dogs that much or wants to dive. That it's not easy to train a dog. No, takes, wow, yeah. yeah. I know it's not even it's not even easy to train my dog. Man, I don't even know what I'm doing still. You know what I'm saying? Like it takes a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think the thing that maybe people that don't have dogs wouldn't realize as much is like they are like people, aren't they? So one dog is not going to be completely different to the next dog, and oh, you've got to tailor it. And and yeah, it's complicated. So so anyway, they said yeah, let's let's get Will on the, on the dog team. And then what happens then in terms of you go and like get introduced to your dog? Do they like say this is going to be your dog or? Are they are they puppy? How old are they when you when you take take them? Or how does that all work? So we had a dog on that to, that same deployment. So I brought it up 
it was decided like, okay, you're very interested. We had a conversation. It's decided it happened very, really quickly. There was a dog on that deployment. His name was Falco. Um, unfortunately, he, we were going after some bad guys. They hid. Uh, Falco engaged them, but there was since there was two guys, as Falco was biting one. The other guy shot Falco a couple of times, and Falco didn't make it. But mm. definitely saved one of us from getting hurt, if not killed. I mean, it was. Yeah, I mean, got I got Falco tattooed on my arm, so you know it's. I was supposed to actually get him on returning home from that deployment, but. He didn't make it. So once we got home, some guys went overseas to buy dogs. That's how we usually get them. So you go overseas, you can buy them here. You get them grown already, so we don't start from puppies. You get them already okay. ready to work. How old, roughly? Two to four. Okay. About three. Yeah. Um, we train some things into them. They already come pretty much trained. Some things we have to take out, some things we have to add. But we mm-hmm. like to get them fairly trained. And we, um, have a group of good guys and we work with good companies to not only send us the handlers to school but help us select dogs that are high quality and it's hard to you're reading the body language how hard is it to read the body language of a person that you're reading going into dog stuff is way more there's certain things that people have that are just watching dogs for years and years know what the drive is like if the dog's going to be scared if he's going to fight like there's certain characters we're definitely looking for so it's good to have those people yeah i went through uh so they went overseas, purchased dogs, or got them locally, whatever. So we found good dogs and got back and got introduced to the dogs. And then I left. So I got to I got hands on as a new guy back, coming back from that deployment with the whole group of things, maybe like ten, let's say eight to ten dogs. And didn't know what I was doing, but we had trainers there to help us. Yeah, know what we're doing, how to properly handle the leash, how to properly what to look for in the dog, the different mannerisms that they were just teaching us and. Seeing that with a, a group of brand new dogs, and all those dogs are different. Eventually, they watched us handle, and the calls were made like these. The fit the fits very important, matching personalities, mm-hmm. so they matched us up with our dogs. I got Cairo, and I was sent out to Adler Horse International in California, on in Ontario. Great school, great people, great family. I learned it was a great, like I said, great school. I learned a lot. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Same, almost same group of dogs, probably. I went out to that school with, and that was like a nine week school. And that was fully immersed with me and Cairo and all the other dogs that were going to be part of the team. And I learned a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just how to handle a start off. I think this is all pretty much military wide with a, even just doing leash work. You do it, some people do it with an ammo can, but just working basic how to get the dog's attention with a choke chain and a leash. Mm hmm. Just walking, and then you go from there to very far to doing FMPs, which are full mission profiles. So that's we had the we had like a put us in a canoe, and you're paddling across a canoe, trying to handle a dog without him oh, flipping wow. the canoe with the guy. Like you know, you're doing all this crazy running with the dog and shooting with the dog and having yeah. scenarios with the dog, and it's crazy. So you're going from very basic to very comfortable. Yeah. It was wow, great. And we were staying in a hotel room, so that was very good. So me and Cairo, we were, just, we were just me and him one-on-one building that bond. So it was a great trip. A bunch of great guys, too. I got guys from the team with me. So I say there was, you know, five, six, seven, eight of us out there. I forget exactly how many. It was a good group of people. Yeah. And working with the the Reavers at that, at that company was just really great people. Made it fun. Great training. Probably one of the best schools I went to. Nice. So before we get into Cairo uh, himself, no ordinary dog, warrior dog, extraordinary dog, however however we want to call him. Um, Before we get into him and his story, like, have you got any, yeah, like tips that you can remember from that school or just that you've learned, like maybe taught yourself along the way or just anything in terms of bonding with a dog, training a dog, just any little, little tidbits for me and or anybody listening. Make it as positive as possible. (laughs) Yeah. Taking a step back, catching yourself when you're in a bad mood. That energy does go down the leash. You want it to be as possible. Mm. Your dog, it just depends on your dog, too. If you have a Shih Tzu, you're not going to have to really do any negative reinforcement unless he's like an ankle biter and you know, whatever. It's not a, but for certain breeds of dogs that can be aggressive, you might need to do corrections with the leash and to, mm. to do those properly. Timing is right. Just knowing what you're doing is very important. Yeah. Um, we're putting in the work to being patient with the dog, trying to make it as positive as possible. 
and then just putting in the work to know how to time it. Because when the dog, you want to catch the dog, because the dog forgets pretty quick. If you discipline him too far afterwards, you know, he doesn't know. So catching with that timing, it, it just paints that picture mm -hmm. for them. They don't understand. And you're yeah. teaching them with these different tools and every dog is different. So every tool, maybe the e-collar is going to work better on my dog than it is on your dog. But for your dog, just treats. Mm -hmm. My dog doesn't like treats. Like I have my Mal boy. And he's so weird. He, he doesn't even eat people food sometimes. <laughs> really? So weird. So treats don't work for him. Yeah. Easy. But ball is great. That's positive reinforcement. So you have to find everybody's, every dog's different, like people. Yeah. yeah that's it. being patient and stepping back when I'm like, I'm having a bad day and this training is just not working out well. It's good. And then having fun with it, being as positive as possible. Yeah. And, and I think dogs kind of have, dog. sorry, go, go on. No, no, you, know, you go. Well. What kind of dog fits your personality and your lifestyle? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I'm not just buying a husky because I love huskies. Next thing you know, that thing is just, crazy in your apartment <laughs> yeah yeah don't get a dog for aesthetics <laughs> yeah no it's not fair to the dog and it's gonna make your life miserable <laughs> yeah for sure uh, definitely um yeah i was gonna say like all dogs are just they have their own thing as well and dogs are gonna have bad days and good days and you were saying about your dog doesn't like one of your dogs doesn't like to take treats and you know, when the dog is with my dog, for example, like when, you know, when a dog is stressed, it's uh, or maybe you want to kind of make a, a situation a bit lighter and a common advice is to, to offer a treat to try and, you know, make it a positive situation. But obviously, I think my dog is not unique in this sense that I think a lot of dogs, when they're stressed, the last thing they want is a treat. They just they're just exactly. going to be like, no, like, get that away from me, yep. like moving the face away. And exactly. that's a hard one. Mm -hmm. So that's when you got to know, like, but I know he loves this toy. So if I mm. take this toy and I wave it up here, the treat, he, he won't pay attention. But if I take this and he'll just give him a look at you, like, okay, or it's a tennis ball. Yeah. Or it's an e it's a collar correction. Because then, you know, just, boop, just a yeah. correction or something. Yeah. You got to just figure out what works for your dog, what gets his attention. And but yeah, I had to really, I was a really quiet guy and I'm a seal. So, you know, the, me going like this and sounding like a weirdo because. It took a while to step out of my comfort zone, but yeah. the dog doesn't know what I'm saying. But if he sees me do that, he's like, oh, shit, this guy's happy. <laughs> like, okay, whatever I'm doing. So, you know, good boy, good boy, good boy is how I pretty much sounded at first. Good boy. And these dogs are going to save our life. Like, they yeah. find explosives. If this dog finds an explosive, I'll do whatever you want, buddy. Like, thank you. You know, it's a big deal. So for me yeah. to step out of my comfort zone and really get comfortable sounding like an idiot, I don't care. It's positive training. It's good stuff too. Yeah. yeah. That's another thing they say, like kind of a cliche, but it, it's definitely true that dog training is maybe more about training us, the, 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 the dog like owner, the, than training the dog itself. And like, I'm similar to you in a say, I mean, obviously it's different because I wasn't a seal and I'm not a seal, but I find I'm, I'm a bit awkward with like, yeah, getting all excited, like outside yeah. when there's people around it's and like shouting and like, yeah, yep. yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, and then I have to check myself as well. Sometimes where I'm like, no, I just, I'm coming way too. I'm like, he's not going to come if I'm just like, come, come here, buddy. Like, come on. Like, cause it, cause in the apartment, yeah, I'm going to be shouting and happy and, you know, right. and then outside it's more low key. <laughs> And obviously, like you said, it goes down the leash. He picks up on it. So it's, yeah, it's finding that balance. But I guess I'm going to try more of what you just did, that, that yeah, whole chirping. I, just, and... I, I get full. I don't care. I'll put on pink Crocs right at the dog. No, I don't take him to the dog park, but yeah. I don't care. No shirt, pink Crocs, short shorts. And I'm just screaming <laughs> my head off. And I'm like, okay, that's too much, too much. But no, I don't, I don't really care anymore. As long as I'm getting good feedback from the dogs. Yeah. So, it's fun once you actually yeah. start doing it and get used to it. Yeah, that's definitely the main thing, having a happy dog. But yeah, just sure. not caring. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. As long as, as long as the dog's happy, it doesn't matter what anybody else uh, sees or thinks or anything like that. That's it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so let's, let's go on to Cairo and, uh, and talk about this, this legendary dog. Um, All right. Give me kind of, yeah, a bit of the background. So obviously you did the training with him. You picked him up when he was like, what, like three-ish, something like that. He was about um, three. What was it like, first of all, like that that whole, I think you said nine weeks in that intensive training place. How was that? Was the vibe with him immediately good? Was there like, were there awkward, tense moments where, you know, because obviously it's not the same as having a, a puppy that's two or three months old where you got to get to build that bond right from the beginning. It must be a bit harder to, to really make that bond strong. Yeah, he looks like a smaller wolf, too. 
you know, he's a Belgian Malinois working yeah. dog that was about 70 pounds, I think. So he was an intimidating dog. So in the yeah. very, very beginning when I first got him, I mean, all dogs, all working dogs, all dogs, period, you should treat with respect and, you know, because you never know these dogs have a mouth and they can bite you. So mm. especially with these working dogs, you're always taught to treat them like a weapon, treat them with respect. These aren't pets. So, but in the beginning, I was very like, didn't really, I don't know you, you don't know me. So I'm like, oh, you know, I don't trust you a hundred percent, but we hit it off pretty quick before you knew it within just a couple of days a week. It's like, all right, he gets on the bed and, you know, start to build that bond more and more. And then a couple of weeks into it, it's like, okay, this dog is cool. I had, he had one of those personalities we call, he has a switch, <clears throat> put the vest on him. You can turn that switch on. It's time to go to work. He's in work mode. And when you take that vest off, the switch is off and he's like, okay, you're kind of a normal dog. I'm still not going to go grab you by your face and <laughs> yeah. do something really bad, but you can turn it off a little bit and you're kind of cool. Yeah. Some dogs, you cannot, some dogs are, they, that switch is just stuck and they're not just they're full working, working dog. dog. Yeah. Their owner takes them out and knows certain things that they can do with them and breaks them and runs them, but never like come hop in bed and come chill with me for a couple of hours. And he's like, no, eventually. Cause that dog, just can't do it. Yeah. So you just never know. But Cairo, he could. Cairo definitely could. Yeah, he was good. By the end of his life, when we got him retired, I mean, I had him on, I was always careful, but had him on the couch with my, my friend's kids upside down in their laps. And he was very good. He could be around people. Didn't have to, I was always watching him, but he never had any, any issues. He even got attacked by my girlfriend's bulldog. And we were on a trip mm. and I was in the shower the dog got toy aggressive and got him in the shoulder and it ripped him a little bit, but he didn't even retaliate. He was pretty laid wow. back. Just, yeah. That's amazing. Oh, I, I love dog. that. I, was lucky. I think that's so cool. Yeah. My girlfriend and her mom were out there and I was, wouldn't hop in the shower real quick. And I guess the, uh, Kyro just went in for the toy and the, got him right in the shoulder and just, uh, your teeth are sharp. You know, I just caught him just a little bit and ripped his skin just a little bit. It wasn't no big mm -hmm. deal, but, Luckily, Cairo is just a laid back dog. He didn't really care about other dogs. He just, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's immense though, isn't it? Because obviously Cairo, like, as, as you said, he's literally, not literally, but he's almost literally a weapon as, you know, he oh, could have, he, if he'd wanted to, he could have absolutely destroyed, like killed that dog in a few seconds, I imagine. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, bulldogs are tough too, but I'm glad that he wasn't, I'm glad he was pretty chill because that could have turned. Yeah. Pretty bad, yeah. It's very cool. I feel like it's like the, the human equivalent is like, you know, the, the, the baddest, the toughest people, the people yeah. that really know they've got it. They're yeah. not, they're not going to be baited into a fight with somebody who's like, come on, like, let's go outside. Let's step out. Like exactly. somebody that really knows they can handle themselves. So they're not going to be uh, yeah, easily swayed into that. And I kind of feel like that's the same, same sort of thing. Yeah. I would agree too. Cause I've yeah. seen some damage you could do and it was no joke. So I was like, Ooh. yeah. And I bet their first reaction, like your girlfriend and, and her mother, when they're watching that, the first reaction is like, oh no, our dog's about to get like absolutely oh, ripped apart. I think it was really quick. I don't even think they noticed. Yeah. Okay. I think wow. it was just quick. Yeah. It just happened so fast. It wasn't bad. It was just a little mark, but yeah. still. But you never know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So anyway, going on. So Cairo, he has the on off switch. He's, he's a working dog, but he's also just a good boy when he's, when he's not at work. So go, go forward with me. Tell me more about his story and how he just, how he showed you how amazing he was. Like, tell me just everything about him. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we went through that training out in California. It was a great trip. Learned a lot. <clears throat> Returned home from that trip and, um, started working together as a team, integrating into the team and getting everybody comfortable with him and, and the other dogs. And eventually it was time to go on deployment. And he ended up actually getting shot on that deployment and kind of the same story, similar, similar to Falco's mm -hmm. two bad guys hiding and Cairo ended up finding them while they were setting up in an ambush. And one of the guys shot him twice, but allowed us to, to engage them. And neutralized the threat, but unfortunately, Cairo got shot through the chest and the arm. And it took him a while to get back because it was a kind of a low wall. He couldn't jump over, couldn't get shot through mm -hmm. the arms. It took him a while to get back to me. And when he did, he just collapsed. And, you know, in Malinois, they don't just fall over. Mm -hmm. So I figured something was really bad. Yeah. I thought he was dead. So, but we made our way over to him. 
Sally was still breathing, and then it was just really cool to see um, us all come together as a team to save him. Uh, he, I thought he was dead. He literally fell over, and I'm like, crap. They usually, this does happen quite a bit, unfortunately, with dogs. They, they just get shot, and usually they don't survive. Um, but one of my teammates came back. You know, we were still in a gunfight. But he knew he wasn't needed, and Kyra really needed him. And he was able, it was perfect. I was, the dogs have their own medical kit. And they weren't, they're part of the team, so I carry it for them. And I, I'm handing it to the guy who happened to have medical training. As I'm taking off his Cairo's gear, he's stuffing hole, the holes in his chest. And it, it, we just, it worked flawlessly as a team. As soon as we were done, our, our head shed had called in a helicopter to pick him up. So we got him there and we brought him onto the plane. Um, surgeon worked on him. I know he's just a dog. There was a surgeon on the plane that helped him. Yeah. Um, surgeon's back on base, treated him just like a soldier. They didn't have to. Uh, they stabilized him, got him to the vets and bath, and they saved him. I didn't think he was going to make it overnight. He was in bad shape. I slept with him right on the floor just in case. And within two days, though, I mean, the next day was real rough. He was moving a little slow. You know, he did get mm. shot. And then the day after that, it seemed like yeah. he was, we had all the tubes out of him. He was wearing sunglasses, shaking his tail. And, wow, man. Some animals. They got a lot of energy. They they take pain quite well. Yeah. He's back on his feet in no time. That's amazing. So, so yeah, then, sorry, go on. Yeah. I have a, a teammate of mine took him to Lackland, and those people mm -hmm. did a great job giving him. Uh, they rehabbed him. Okay. And uh, I stayed on deployment and worked another dog named Bronco. And uh, yeah, got him. They, they. I wasn't sure if I was going to get him back once I returned home and how he would act, but they did a very good job rehabbing him. I wow. never saw any issues with him until he started getting very old. They had to put a steel plate in his leg. Mm -hmm. You could kind of see him a little, a little hitch in his step, but it yeah took a while for that to happen in old age. That's amazing. So, so to go back to the when when he got shot, those those guys that were trying to ambush you, did any of you like the humans realize? They were there. Did you have any idea of exactly where they were, or was that purely Cairo that sniffed them out? We, we we knew they were running from us, and we didn't know exactly where they were. It was a, it was a pretty big tree line. Yeah, we didn't know that they were setting up. One guy was getting high with an automatic PKM weapon, so a machine gun, and one other. They were trying to lure us in and set us up. It was definitely it was a big setup from what I heard. Yeah, and uh, them shooting at Cairo allowed us to see exactly where they were, and they were engaged. Yeah. They were taken wow. care of pretty quickly. Yeah. So he, yeah, saved some lives that day then. Oh, yeah. And they were trying to get us to come in. And they, they definitely had a big, yeah. they had a machine gun waiting for us. And there's no telling what else. So probably some rockets. Who knows? Yeah. 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 Who knows? But he saved some lives and then you guys saved his life. So it's a nice, happy ending story, that one. <laughs> and we got to go do some more missions. That was just yeah, the start. So, so the next missions did with things like a little bit smoother in terms of he, he didn't get shot on the next missions. Like was, yeah, how, like it was just fine. Did yeah, some very good missions. We were busy, but didn't get shot that one. On that one. Yeah, so. wow, that's that's amazing. And then obviously you would have been gearing up. I don't know how like the time difference in between these two points, but you would have been not too far away, I guess, from Neptune Spear, uh, the the Osama bin Laden. So right. We, got up. we went on the next deployment. We returned back from that deployment with no issues. And then a couple of, I guess, weeks later, we were called to get ready to do that. Yeah. So how did that go, come about? Like they just say, like, get ready. You you just, you need to be ready, basically. I'm, I'm assuming they didn't give you well, much actually, information. I was a little mad. I was on a great diving trip in, uh, I think it was Miami. It yeah. was great. I was loving, I loved the diving <laughs> trips. It was just, Go have fun on the water in a beautiful in beautiful Florida and hang out with my buddies and have good food and cocktails. It was a great trip. I love that trip and get some yeah. good training in. We don't always get to dive and to get to dive and refresh on that. So I was uh all of a sudden I got called away from that and I, I remember being not happy. Yeah. And you're gonna recall me from this trip. Like out of all the trips, like <laughs> come on. There's a bunch of us that were not happy. But obviously, it was totally worth it. So, yeah, got so called did, back from that. We started training for the mission. And did they give much away, or was it all very like they're just like super, you know, very vague in the beginning, and then yeah. eventually we were briefed and started to rehearse. Yeah, 
And can you go into that a little bit in terms of your your role and Cairo's role in all that? I mean, obviously, yeah. if there's stuff you can't say, no worries. Just just say whatever you can say and feel comfortable saying. Yeah, Cairo and I, we um, our roles that night were to, you know, the dogs are their noses are great, man. So they're used to yeah. find people hiding or explosives. So my job was to take him and do sweeps of the perimeter after we land, and you know, just look for any explosives or any any tunnels. Mm-hmm. Um, for anything weird, I just watched yeah. the dog look for a change of behavior. If he picks up any odors, so we did sweeps around the outside until we felt it was scared. Then we moved inside, and then on the inside, I'm looking for explosives and hidden rooms, anything. Um, I've been in a couple of those houses that were rigged to explode before, so that's never fun. So having yeah. a dog on target, just you know, if anything, if he smells anything, it's always kind of good to have. Um, so we started doing sweeps on the inside until. It was called that we had got him, and then uh, we made our way to Xville to make sure, you know, people weren't coming in. So we kind of held security on that side, and we made our way to Xville. Wow, I bet that was intense, though. I bet that was like a mad, a mad night. How long before that night were you aware of who the target was? It's like a couple weeks to a month, maybe. Yeah, it's hard to remember exactly how long? We, we yeah. Knew we were yeah. And I guess then just your focus would go up and like everything was just. It was all just, I mean, we were used to working. I was around a very professional group of guys. Yeah. But, I mean, there is no joke who you're I, dealing with. It's yeah. no matter what, what it is. It, even yeah. if it was him yeah, just going on a normal operation, these guys don't fuck around. No. It's going to be no joke. It doesn't matter who the fuck it is. Yeah. But it was definitely, you know, it made a difference. But everybody was just business as always, no matter what the target is. I mean, once the operation happened, half the guys almost died in a helicopter crash. But luckily, those TF-160 guys are badass, and they didn't crash the bird. They landed it, and they said they could fly it out of there. That's how awesome those guys are. Oh, uh, the guys go from a near-death experience to crushing it. So it's like you're around a group of professional guys. It's just it's just any yeah. other night. It doesn't matter who it is. We're going to go crush it. And that's yeah. the value they had then. So. Yeah. But it, obviously, it was a little different. Gave it a bit of an edge. But yeah, I mean, who was going after is very important. It was one of those things where we thought we would probably die. Mm. Who we were going into Pakistan, and you would probably have something set up. You know, or we figured there was a good chance something would explode, or somebody would shoot us down, or something bad would happen. We had a very we we all made sure our wills were filled out, and our life insurance policies were taken care yeah. of, and our families were. Yeah, there's a very good chance. So that was a little different. But th- that that's always the case. It's yeah, I guess that's always in the back of your mind, but I suppose it was more at the forefront this time. But how was that to deal with? Like, how is it to deal with that? I mean, obviously, it's, you know, stranger to, to being in that kind of situation. And that wasn't your first time. It's not like you were green behind the ears or anything. But but how is it to adjust to that? Like, knowing you're going into a deployment where, yeah, there's, there's a reasonable chance I might not come back. And like, how'd you get your head around it? Do you just kind of switch off? Yeah, it's the same thing as every deployment. Yeah, I would rather it be me than one of the other guys. So I'm hoping I don't make a mistake. Is that's what I'm thinking. I'm hoping I don't fuck up to hurt somebody else. Yeah, and I'll just work to the best of my ability. But it was like that every deployment. And on this one, like, so if it's even if it's a little bit higher, who cares? It's always, it's always. And I get I'm around the people that I care about the most. If I'm going to go, going after this dickhead is perfect around the people that I really care about. There's no other way yeah. I'd really kind of rather go. Yeah. It sucks, but I'm I'm still a little young, but I'm surrounded by an awesome group of guys going after somebody that needs to be taken care of. So yeah, I wasn't too worried about it. But in general as well, like on just any other deployment, like it must be a hard thing to get your head around or do you just try to not think into it too much and don't let yourself, like don't indul- indulge yourself. You're just like, okay, just switch it's that always there, off. But I'm there yeah. doing a job at how like this is what I want to be doing with my life. And I yeah. literally did, really cared about the people. The guys were awesome. The guys, it's just my yeah. family. Yeah. I'm doing a cool job. So it's always there, but I mean, I'm doing what I want to do. So if it happens, then it's just, it's up to me. It's up to God. Yeah. So I mean, what else? Yeah, I can die in a car wreck too, but you know, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Um, so anyway, you did have one where you kind of did nearly die, I guess. I don't know the details of it. So I'm hoping. A of yeah. <laughs> I bet there's been more than one. Yeah. It's been, 
I, I thank God all the time. There's a couple that stick out in my mind where I'm like, thank yeah. you. Like literally take one more step and could have just, it would have been a rule better. The one I was going to ask you about is the grenade, the grenade one, but, but tell me about any others that, that stick in your mind as well before that. Well, the other one wasn't very interesting. It's just, there's a couple that I think about that's like, yep, thanks. Thanks for looking out yeah. for me, man. That was a, whew. and the grenade one was the same. It was a, a piece hit me right here in the face. I think it blew up behind me. Um, I was leaning forward probably an inch or two. It, it might have hit mm-hmm. me in the temple and you know, tell what would happen there. So I'm, I was very fortunate in my career. You know, it sucks getting injured, but all in all, nobody else died. You know, there's three of us that got hit that night. I think there was actually more just because some guys didn't say anything. Um, nobody got really seriously injured. I mean, some the other two guys got um, I suffered some traumatic brain injury from that. That yeah. It's not just that from other things as well, but another guy that got injured with me, he, uh, I think both guys got it, but one guy in particular, he got it pretty bad. That kind of, you know, that's pretty permanent, but I'm hoping he's doing better. But other than that, it was just um, shrapnel, which isn't that big a deal. Nobody lost a mm-hmm. limb or could have lost my eye or something. So it was just another night going after a target. Um, they found out we were there and they started throwing grenades out the window, the second story window and one just landed behind. We were out in the field trying to get an angle on him, and one I didn't hear it land, or I think it might hurt land. I don't know. It's yeah, a little fuzzy. It blew up behind us and got three of us. Shit, man. I got two Forrest Gump wounds, so it could have been definitely could have been worse. I'm glad I didn't have Cairo with me that night because, you know, obviously they were coming yeah. in low, so I, didn't, I wouldn't want him to get hit. But I got two Forrest Gump wounds that night, and things, like I said, could have been way worse. Some in the face, some in the hand, a bunch in the arm and stuff but it wasn't too bad everybody everybody made it out of there yeah. okay but i guess some of the worst wounds and and hardest things to recover from can be mental as well right the things we don't see so i mean yeah. tell me a bit more about that traumatic brain injury that you got <laughs> from that and like how that was to deal with and how it was to come to terms with and to recover from and all that kind of thing just talk me through the process a little bit man yeah so the physical stuff wasn't too bad like i said two force going yeah to- that was nothing compared to the migraines I started to get. And the memory loss was real bad. And I felt something was off. So my mind just wasn't, I mean, I was a pretty high functioning individual. You had to, you had to be pretty high functioning to have the job that I was at. And I always felt pretty comfortable. And I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I was yeah. feel good. And then all of a sudden there's just this shift and like, I can't focus or I can't remember. Or I can't just, something was off and, the migraines, migraines. I think it was a lot of stress. My hair had fallen out a few times. Uh, big clumps. Oh, wow. It's called right. alopecia, and that was after the deaths, the deaths of some of my very close friends. And stress. You know, it's not hard. I'm not a doctor, but it's pretty easy yeah. to figure out that lost friends, hair starts falling out, my fingernails had fallen out, and then uh, putting alcohol on top of that to kind of calm myself down and cope. So alcohol was, I'm not saying it's bad for everybody. I used to have fun and party with my friends and build camaraderie, but eventually it turned into a real bad mm-hmm. thing to where it's not, I'm going out having fun with my friends once a, a weekend. It's, it's a yeah. problem. And then, uh, like I wasn't showing up to work and drinking, but just wasn't performing. I was at a very important job I needed to perform at. So that didn't help. And then the migraines and just all the back pain and all blah, 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 that, but, uh, it's put me in a real bad place. Yeah. And that was kind of my point to transition out of the military. It was after that, that explosion where I kind of just didn't work out. Then after, uh, yeah, after the death of my, one of my best friends in the air falling out again, it was just, that was pretty much it. Like something was off. Yeah. Well, I imagine me piling that much like emotional and physical stress on you, like on you with all these, from all these different directions, you know, like losing friends, having like the, the traumatic brain injury, seeing the things I'm sure you've seen and just, yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna be hard. It's gonna be really hard. It was just a weird spot. Yeah. Thing. I wasn't used to, usually thinking clear and fine and happy. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I just can't focus him. It just wasn't the same. It was just not good. Yeah. So I needed to take a step back and then that grenade the migraines the migraines are terrible and then i feel bad because i can't show up to work and i'm like feel like i'm letting people down and my boss and hey man i got a migraine <laughs> another one yeah, yeah so i can't work and i'm like what the fuck is the point of me being here it's holding everybody else back so then 
yeah, it was a weird spot to be in. And then transitioning out of the military, losing my family. So going from there to drinking problem, lose, gaining a lot of weight, memory sucks, migraines suck. Then I'll lose my support system, and now I got to find a different job, and I'm moving. Moving, yeah, it's, it's not the best. Yeah. But um, how did you kind of get through that time? How did you, like, how did you turn the corner? I guess. I moved back to Texas and held a job, but I didn't do so well there. I basically, drank myself out of that job. It was just didn't see how bad of a place yeah. I was in, even though I was like probably up to 250 pounds drinking myself to death. Just like, I'm fine. <laughs> just can't like, what the yeah. fuck? Can't see it. Yeah. But Hey bro, you're not, uh, I drank myself out of that job and then taking a step back. I started off going, my, my buddy, Jared Shaw, who I was talking about earlier. Great guy. He wanted to go to, a, it's called the brain treatment foundation. They, do a method called transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS treatment. And, um, I went through that program for six or seven weeks and then supplements. So you get testosterone therapy and some just your basic vitamins, different supplements, and they do blood work on you. So I started doing a little bit of that. So it was luckily my, my friend Jared. And then I went through a, a few other programs to help me kind of quit the drinking. So, just a few different things, trying different modalities out, and um, some work, some don't. I did a like a, a thing called the ganglion block. What's that? <clears throat> There's a bundle of nerves somewhere in the middle of your neck. I don't quote me on all this, <laughs> but basically, they have to stick a certain liquid, maybe it's lidocaine or some sort of some sort of liquid into the bundle of nerves to kind of give it a reset and relax it. And, helps your parasympathetic your sympathetic nervous system kind of just reset to your fight or flight system so they have to stick a, a needle into your neck somewhat and find the right spot there's an ultrasound and once they hit that spot it can help you just kind of have that sympathetic yeah. reset parasympathetic reset I think it helped <clears throat> in the beginning but I don't think it was mm -hmm. permanent I think it's a modality some people might be open to trying maybe not but after being out, I've been out for about six years now. I think there's all kinds of different things. We had float tanks back at my old job that you can try to meditate. Meditation is huge. Breathing, like we were talking about Wim Hof not too long ago. I think yeah. that's great. Everybody's different. Maybe Wim Hof isn't for you. Maybe it's holotropic. Or I, don't, I haven't even tried a whole bunch of different ones. But I know that going back when I was in Buds, what did I do when I was in that freezing cold San Diego water when everybody else was quitting? I was probably taking deep breaths and I was going to my happy yeah. place. Like, what was I doing in all the stressful situations as a SEAL? You're breathing, you're going, you're trying to get into a flow state, you're trying to relax, you're trying to focus. And so it's the same, same thing. So now I try to meditate and breathe. There's all kinds of different things to get into. Ice baths, air chambers. So yeah, I just opened my eyes. But that was my first step. Was my good friend, Jared. Kind of like, he saw I was in a bad place. Like, I would have died. I should have. I actually should be dead. I gotten myself into some bad situations, especially with this dream. Yeah. Now and then I've, and uh, my connection with God has been the biggest part. I would say of that having that connection, I guess I was in a bad place for a while and losing friends didn't help. So fixing that side was. Yeah. Huge. That's an amazing journey, man. I mean, and it sounds like you're in a much better place now with like the meditating and stuff. I'm doing pretty good. Same here. I'm on the water right now, and I come out here, and I think I try to try to do it. And so I try to do breath work. Yeah. So I think breath work, some sort of maybe my mind is just not ready just to sit and just do do meditation. So I try to do breath work, and if that means doing yoga, so I try to do yeah. some yoga. That'll get me to start concentrating on my breath. I don't know. There's different. I'm still learning as yeah. well, man. So I'm still trying to. Yeah, for out. sure. You know, like the generic kind of meditation when you like look online, you're like looking for tips. It's always like focus on your breathing. But for me personally, if I like go into my head and I'm just like quiet, eyes closed, focusing on my breathing, I get too focused on my breathing, and then I feel like I can't kind of catch my breath right, and I can't breathe nicely, and it's weird. So I feel like for me that doesn't really work. I heard one. I think it was maybe on Netflix. Like some meditation show was advising if 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 you don't like focusing on your breathing, focus on a word or something like that, or like and I like peace or love or yeah, like something like that. And said so that's probably more what I I might try and do. But 
yeah, it's just hard actually having that. I, I don't know whether it's just self-discipline or whether it's just being in the right frame of mind, but it's hard to... I think it's different. just trying to do it. You stick with it because it takes a minute. Yeah. To, just like with yeah. anything. But then once you do it, because then, then it might not work. Like you said, the breathing. You know, like, I put in all that work to try breathing and then it didn't work. So why the, I'm not going to try anything else, but it's like, if you would have just tried that word thing, you're like, holy crap. If you do that for, you know, a month straight for, you know, three times a week. By the end of the month, you're like, holy shit, yeah. this is it. So, you know, like intermittent fasting might work for somebody. The keto diet, like just, well, you try one diet, it doesn't work. And you're like, well, that doesn't work. Dieting isn't for me. It's, it's hard. It's yeah. hard. So sticking with something, and even myself, I try to, I don't do my breathing exercises all the time. But there's certain things that I do have that are my, I guess what you call anchors or certain things that I do every day. Do you feel comfortable to share what some of those are? Like uh, some of your, your anchor, kind of as you put it. Every day I try to get up and I, I do some breathing, deep breathing, and I pray. Mm-hmm. That's like number one. If I can do that every day and I don't, so some days I forget, I try to yeah. make up for it, but then I can get down and pray. And so I'm grateful to be alive. I've had some pretty like said, near near death experiences. So I'm very happy <laughs> yeah. to be here. I'm glad to be feeling better. I'm very grateful. So I try to knock that out. Just be thankful for anything. Pray to whoever. Um, and while I'm down there, I'll do some breath work and maybe some stretching. So that's one of my anchors. And then um, just trying to find those. Um, so just going the way sometimes you get bored lifting to try to like keep an open mind and try like whether it's jujitsu or paddle boarding or so, trying these different ways to jogging here and switching it yeah. up to keep some sort of physical activity. Yeah, I think going. that's really important as well, isn't it? Having a physical activity because I can get lazy yeah. for sure. So trying to find something to keep it interesting that keeps me active. Yeah, that's solid. And I guess dogs as well help in it. <laughs> and dog, that's that's what keeps me yeah. active. Yeah, good call. Dogs, they keep me busy. They keep me from being lazy because you got to stimulate yeah. them. It just got done raining. I'm here. I'm in Texas, and it rained for I don't even know a week, maybe straight. So I was cooped up inside, and uh, they definitely go crazy. <laughs> so they let you. Know. They let you know, like, hey man, it's time to exercise. Yeah, yeah when you have yeah. no option, even when you're feeling like shit, you have to go out when you got a no dog. Not, so they keep me, they keep me pretty yeah, busy. Yeah, for sure. And I, and it's not just the exercise as well that you get from the dog. I mean, I don't know about you, but or I think it's probably going to be similar. But when I when I'm having a bad day or a, or a bad five minutes or whatever it is, my puppy is all over me. He's like, he can tell, he can feed off it straight away, and he knows when I need him, like Great. up on my lap or like you know, he'll just come and put his two front paws on me, and it's just half on me half on the floor and it'll just it'll just be there you know just like get you out of something yeah, yeah when i'm like i don't do social media much anymore like i just sorry i just don't do it i get sucked in and or whatever if i'm having a bad day the dog comes up and i'm doing something and i'm not being present I'm like they definitely yeah. not all the time but they can remind me like all right i'm just gonna enjoy yeah for yeah. sure gets me out of a bad mood or gets me to be like all right get off your phone or quit doing this let's go Definitely, because, yeah. definitely. Because that's another thing I, I struggle with is being present. Or well, I don't know if I struggle with it compared to the average person, but it's it's hard sometimes. It's with like you say, social media and phones and yeah, smartphones and TV screens, computers, and everything going on. It's hard to sometimes, yeah, just be yep. in that moment mm-hmm. and just not be thinking about what happened yesterday or what's going to happen tomorrow. And yeah, yeah, it can be hard. I try to think yeah. that, like you said, when your dog comes up to you, I try to make that like a trigger yeah. of like when I see the dog doing that, I'm like, all right take a step back and see what i'm doing if it's is it that important or can i take a minute to, to like, prioritize you know? the dog because that's what it's all about yeah. <laughs> so tell me um talking on this subject cairo so he came you guys had like a nice kind of happy ending together right he tell me about that yeah when, once i got him retired yeah he he got a, he had a good good life we got him finally retired and got him home and we spoiled we have this big kind of beanbag thing called a love sack just to jump in really quickly before you go on with the love sack um when somebody like in your situation when they've got their dog in like in the military is it very commonplace for when the dog retires to be adopted by the handler or is it kind of like happens sometimes or what's the thing with that it depends on the dog's personality okay all the dogs are different and if your dog is like a very aggressive dog and you get a house full of kids okay but for you, I guess you it's always kind of had this in the back of your mind, maybe. Yeah, oh, definitely, because I knew he had the yeah. personality and always watch him. Like I said, always he's a intact dog. Yeah, yeah. 
some dogs know you're just unless the dog the guy lives by himself he knows that and maybe but yeah no not all dogs but i would say the majority do yes they're the majority and handlers will get their first choice or yeah. pick. it sometimes it gets complicated but i would say yeah for the majority of the time they do get to go they go to a good home like mike ritland has uh warrior dog foundation which takes in dogs that are either hard to handle and he gives them a home and exercises awesome. them and stimulates them and gives them a good place to live out the rest yeah. of their life oh, that's nice so he has a foundation which is cool but uh yeah we, when i got him retired he was able to come home and we trusted him enough and he ate sleep we had that was his dog bed a big expensive <laughs> bean bag of things he slept in that a lot and we had a, a boat at the time we still had it in a we would take him out on the boat quite a bit in Virginia Beach. And I had a motorcycle with a sidecar, so I'd Amazing. load him up in the sidecar sometimes and we'd go driving yeah. around. And we had lots of time together. We didn't leave him alone too yeah. much. Try not to. We had a good we had a good retirement. That's awesome. And and like how how many years did you have him for after he retired and you uh, you adopted him? Only lasted about a year. But it was a good year. It was good to have him at home for a while to give him a good little bit of retired life and take yeah, care of him. Sure. And it was a rough, rough at the end for him with, with him. So it was good to be able to take care of him and be there for him. And it wasn't the easiest. Oh, really? The end of his life. How, how did he die? Was it kind of natural or not so natural? And, you know, bad cancer. It was stomach cancer too. So it was hard to feed him sometimes and he got pretty frail. Mm. It was tough, but it was good to be able to yeah, care for, for him. Sure. Give him the proper not. He took care of me. He got shot for me. So at least I could do is definitely, yeah. Hope we did a good job. No, I mean, it sounds like an amazing dog. I wish I could have met him. How many? Uh, how many dogs have you got now? We have two. We have a, a boy, Mal. He's about four now. His name is Axe, and his daughter. She's coming up maybe on two years, maybe soon. So she's oh, also you've got yeah the dog and his the dog's daughter. You got, you got father and daughter. Yep, I gave uh, the female. Yeah. She's, yeah, I gave the female that would had the litter to my my father, so he has her. She's a good cool. dog. And, uh, I kept the father and yeah. his pup. So they're, they're nice. a lot. It's a lot of dog. <laughs> they keep me real. And like I said, I hadn't exercised them in days before then. They've been going crazy. So they got a good day on the water yesterday, but it wasn't it wasn't enough. They need another day on the water to get them back to yeah. yeah. Worn out. Would you get any more? Do you think you're going to get any more dogs? Two, no. sure, like you stick right. to two. I was just babysitting our friend's little puppy. And I'm like, <laughs> Actually, the puppy. Yeah, it's so much work. You got to stimulate them. Yeah, you got you to put in that work, man. It's a lot of yeah. work. And just having two of them that aren't really puppies anymore is a lot. So no, <laughs> thank you. Maybe one day if I have the property and I'm staying local, you know, because traveling with them is yeah. a pain, and having somebody walk. But no, two is definitely plenty. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. One is plenty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's they are a handful, but they are they're amazing, right? Dogs, they're amazing. Well, they're amazing. Yeah. You gotta put if you put in the work, if you have the time and you know what you're doing, you put in the work. They're awesome, man. We have all kinds of different routines that we do and they're great. They do tricks. Their obedience is great. We have fun on the water. Yeah. And, uh, I bet you've got the best trained dogs like in, in America. <laughs> the best trained dogs. Like, I don't do any bite work with them or anything like that, but I think they're protective instincts. But in terms of like domestic as well, like like domestic training. Yeah, they listen for you. They sit and stay. And the puppy still needs some work here and there, but they listen really yeah. well. Yep. And they, uh, I sleep better at night knowing that I got two of them around. They wake me up just in, just in yeah. case. So. That's cool. Any tips for recall? Because I imagine their recall is like fire. Whereas, uh... yeah, well, using a long line and a a choke chain or a prong, and then just having that. So here, here, they need a couple of pops to get them to come, and then a treat. If your dog like treat, you just got to work with it. But uh, I say a long line here, here, give them some pops and get them to come, come, come. And once they do, praise, praise like crazy as much as you can, and then treat, treat, praise. I don't know whatever makes them the happiest. Yeah. Just do that, do that, do that, and then uh, e collar. But be careful with the e collar. If you know, nobody just throw an e collar on your dog and blast it. It's do your research and watch some videos and take some courses, find their tritration level and use it properly. But e collars can be great for recall. 
but I would start with the long line mm-hmm. treat based or just treat based. Yeah. That'll work. Yeah. I, I, I just struggle with like trusting to let my dog off the lead, you know, the, in the sense that, long yeah. Line. Get that long line, get about 15, 20, 30 feet, however long you want to yeah. get them and have treats ready and just here and just give them a couple pops, get them closer, a couple pops. And once they start getting it, like, okay, then do it and do it and do it. When you're like, okay, I don't need the long line anymore. Maybe the treats will work. And then, once they're old enough, you know, obviously you don't put a e collar on the puppy, but once they're old enough and you've broken them with the e collar, you don't have to use um, the shock. You can use vibrate or tone. And that tone, as soon as they hear the tone, and then you give them their favorite treat once they get to you, all you need is the tone. Okay, to get them. cool. Every time they hear it, they know exactly come by. Come back to I didn't realize there was a, like an e-collar where you could just do tone or anything like that. Because I, I mean, I've never tried one or anything like that, but I just assumed they were like, yeah, a little shock or a buzz or something. But but even the shots don't mm. blast them. You start very, very low. And it's just like, a, so how is a mom going to correct their puppy? It's going to like nip their neck probably, right? Just give them a little correction. Mm. Same thing you're doing with a, a choke chain. You're just you're not choking the dog. That's yeah. terrible. Just giving it a, like, hey, getting his attention, hitting it on the neck. Same thing with an e-collar. You're just tapping him. You don't blast yeah. him. So. All you're doing is saying, hey, you can do that with a tone. If your dog is that kind of dog, your beep, the beep is like, hey, they want me. And I go back over there, I'm going to get a treat. So yeah. That's when we do our vibration. Awesome. All right. Well, well look, that, that's that's epic, man. This was this was really interesting. I really, really enjoyed this. And like I say, I just wish I could have met Cairo. <laughs> me too. Yeah, he was a good one. What a dog. No ordinary dog and warrior dog. We had a lot of great no ordinary dog. We had a lot of no ordinary dogs yeah. in the team. I got to work with a lot of ordinary guys. And no ordinary dog. It was, it was quite the experience. Yeah, I bet. So, one of the best times of my life. The last thing I'm going to ask you before I let you go to your dogs is just if you've got a message to send to anybody that's watching or listening. It doesn't have to be about anything in particular. It doesn't have to be about dogs, although it can be. It can literally be anything, anything you want to say if there's a few words and no pressure to say anything, but... Yeah, no, I, I guess Memorial Day is coming up, so it's always um, good to memorialize the guys that paid the ultimate price and the dogs too, because like I said, these dogs do the same thing. So it's, um, yeah, I appreciate you having me on here. It was a great conversation, seriously. And yeah, since it's Memorial Day, just never forget sacrifice. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you coming on, man. Thanks very much. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. You too, Will. Cheers. Cheers, man. Thanks for listening to my talk with Will Chesney. If you liked it, please check us and Will out on Instagram. If you want to learn more about Will's time as a SEAL and about the legendary Cairo, give No Ordinary Dog a read or think about buying Warrior Dog as a gift for someone younger. All relevant links are in the description. Thank you, Will, for giving me your time and for sharing your amazing stories, especially when there are clearly so many emotions attached to them. Be nice, be happy, be cool.